Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh My dear students, welcome back to our course English Literature of the 17th century Today is our 10th uh, lecture as you can see on uh, the screen and inshallah we are going to start uh, a new uh, play uh, which is All for Love by Dryden as you can see on the screen here uh, it's an enjoyable, uh, interesting play. Definitely, inshallah, you are going to enjoy it. And uh, as we are used to uh, in our lectures, we are going to show uh, the uh, sample of the questions at the end of each uh, lecture, inshallah. Uh, as you can see on the screen, we have here, this is the title of our play, All for Love. And it is written by... Uh, uh, one of the most famous um, dramatists in English literature uh, who is John Dryden. We are going to start our lecture with uh, having an idea about the dramatic works of Dryden. We have, uh, as you can see on the screen, large number of plays written by Dryden. Uh, Dryden uh, was one of the first writers to take an advantage of the reopening of the theaters which had been closed when the Puritans under uh, Cromwell came to power in England. And of course we uh, covered this already uh, at the very beginning of this course when we uh, have known that all the theaters were closed by the Puritans. Uh, and so as you can see that Dryden was one of the first writers to take an advantage of the reopening. He was one of uh, the main reasons uh, for uh, reopening these uh, theaters which were closed by the Puritans. And Dryden wrote a large number of dramas which are detailed below under appropriate headings. So these are the dramatic works of uh, Dryden, as you can see, categorized into uh, different types, uh, starting with uh, the comedies. Uh, as you can see, that uh, the uh, comedy plays uh, that were written by Dryden are these uh, lists uh, in front of you, these works that you have in front of you starting with uh, The Wild Gallant, uh, Secret Love, or The Maiden Queen, Sir Martin uh, Marle, also An Evening's Love, uh, Marriage a la Mode, uh, and we have also uh, The uh, Signation, The Kind Keeper, we have also uh, uh, Amphitryon. These are the comedies written by um, John Dryden. So uh, one of you uh, might ask how will be the question about uh, uh, these uh, uh, comedies. So uh, you might have a question like this as, as the one that you have written here on the bottom of the screen. One of these uh, is a comedy of Dryden. So I might uh, I give you a question uh, that uh, is like this one. One of these is a comedy of Dryden and you have four works uh, and I will choose one of these comedies to be in as one of these four options uh, in front of you or one of these alternatives or choices in front of you. For example, I might choose the uh, wild gallant, as you can see, and write any other uh, four works by him or by any other uh, dramatists. So uh, you need to know these uh, titles of his uh, comedies, just in case uh, if you have a question like this, to know which one of these four works is the comedy of Dryden. So as you can see, the question is one of these is a comedy of Dryden. So you might have the wild gallant and any other 
three uh, choices any other works by uh, either uh, him or any other one so for example so the, if if we move to the next page we have for example tragedy comedies so i might take these three works that he has here uh, in tragic comedies and put them with one of uh, uh, these comedies here in front of you so definitely you need to know that this work is a comedy and the other three works are tragic comedies okay i i think now uh, it is quite clear uh, what i really want you to uh, do so i will uh, select one of the works uh, either in comedies or in tragedy or in tragic comedies and ask you one of these is a comedy so you need to circle or to know the answer uh, which is uh, uh, related to uh, the question okay so these are the comedies if we move to another uh, type of writings uh, by john dryden we have what we call here uh, tragedy uh, comedies tragic comedies he has uh, already three in his list uh, that the rival ladies this is one of his tragic comedies the spanish uh, friar also love triumphant these are three uh, tragic comedies okay the same case uh, you might have these three and i might put uh, or select one of the works which is not one of these uh, three tragic comedies and uh, write a question which is one of these is not tragic comedies okay so i might uh, choose a work from comedies for example the wild gallant that the one that we mentioned in the previous uh, page and put the wild gallant with these uh, three choices okay so I will ask you one of these is not tragedy uh, comedies of Dryden so you need to select here the wild gallant which is uh, of course uh, belonging to the, the comedies and not to the tragic comedies please you need to know and to study the titles of his works either the comedies tragic comedies or tragedies or operas or whatever okay so this part is important because now I told you how your questions will be uh, about this uh, part. Okay, so if we move to uh, next page, we have here tragedies, including uh, heroic plays. So we started with the comedies, and we uh, move to the tragic comedies, and then we move to his tragedies. So in his tragedies, we have uh, the Indian Emperor. We have also uh, Tryon's Love or the Royal uh, Martyr. Also, uh, we have uh, Almanzor and uh, Almahant. We have Amboya. We have Oring Zibi. Uh, and All for Love. And this is the play that we are going to... Uh, study inshallah together or it has another name which is the world well lost it's the same play but uh, this is uh, what we call it might be a subtitle or something to this play so this is the play that we are going inshallah to study uh, um, um, during the coming lectures inshallah so all for love or the world well lost uh, we have also Don uh, Sebastian and we have uh, Columns. also this is one of his uh, tragedies. The same uh, 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 will be for these uh, other uh, tragedies that we have here. So I might select one of this, uh, for example the Indian Emperor or whatever and uh, saying one of these is a tragedy of Dryden. And giving you four choices uh, in which you will have one of one only will be a tragedy of Dryden okay so please again you need to know these uh, titles of uh, the plays okay now we have another type of writings by uh, John Dryden which is 
uh, operas. He wrote also operas, and uh, he has uh, already in his list three operas, starting with The State of Innocence. Uh, this is one of his uh, operas. Uh, we have also Alpian and Alpinus, and we have uh, another one which is King Arthur. Okay, so these are his uh, three operas. As you can see on the screen, one of these is an opera of Dryden. So uh, uh, you might have King Arthur, for example, with other three uh, choices. Uh, and uh, asking you, uh, one of these is an opera of uh, Dryden. So you need to go directly here to uh, King Arthur to choose as an opera of, written by uh, John Dryden. Okay, I think now uh, the, the picture is quite clear in front of you. So uh, concerning these uh, works, the dramatic works of um, John Dryden, you need to know the titles and to which type this title belongs. Either it belongs to uh, comedies or either it belongs to tragedies or operas or tragic comedies. Uh, and of course, uh, your question, your choice, inshallah, will be the best one. I'm quite sure of this. Okay, so it's quite simple, but what you need is to be familiarized with these uh, titles to know this is uh, uh, an opera or this is a tragedy or this is a tragic comedy and so on okay if we move to uh, the next page we have uh, here a brief idea about John Dryden our uh, great dramatist uh, as you can see on at the screen we have here Dryden was a man of uh, versatile genius so he was genius he uh, distinguished himself as a poet uh, as a dramatist and also as a, uh, as a critic so uh, he is genius he has different talents uh, being as a poet being as a dramatist being as uh, also a critic, which means that he wrote many poems, he wrote many dramas, and also he wrote many uh, articles uh, in criticism. He made a name for himself in the writing of both verse and prose. So uh, he wrote verse and prose. However, it is not as a dramatist that he won immortality which means that it is not his drama which made him immortal his greatness rests chiefly upon his uh, poetry which means that he uh, is well known as a poet more than as a dramatist and his literary uh, criticism so his literary criticism uh, and also his uh, poetry made him well known to the people more than even his dramas. As for his drama, it is only all for love, which still endures and which will always endure. Which means that uh, all for love is his uh, most famous uh, play. Uh, which all the people know uh, uh, him as a dramatist by uh, this uh, play. So if you mention uh, John Dryden as a dramatist, it comes immediately to your mind the title of the play All for Love, this play which we are going inshallah to uh, study together in this course. Uh, also, uh, the play, uh, if we have an idea about this play, as you can see, the play was written and first performed in December in 1677. Uh, last time I told you that uh, the dates are important. Uh, the dates of the works are important. So, uh, you might have uh, a question, which is... Uh, uh, all for love 
was written and first performed in December and um, and you have different uh, four uh, choices of the dates. You have uh, uh, 1677, 1678, 1679, or uh, 1675, or whatever. Okay, so you need to know that this play was written in 1677. Okay, the dates are important either in this or either in. Uh, the previous uh, works which we uh, already covered. All for Love deserves a very high rank in British drama. So uh, it is well known in a play and it has a high rank in the uh, British uh, drama. Okay. Now the subtitle. Dryden gave to his play a subtitle which is the uh, world well lost. This is the one that we have just mentioned a few uh, minutes ago. Uh, that our play, All for Love, has a subtitle which is The World Well uh, Lost. This is uh, the subtitle of our play, uh, All for Love. Okay, the subtitle means that. The subtitle means that. Anthony, who is uh, the hero, uh, the main character in our play, did well to uh, sacrifice his empire, to sacrifice his empire for the sake of his love for Cleopatra. And Cleopatra also is the main, uh, is the main uh, female character that we have in this play. So Antony uh, did well to sacrifice his empire for the sake of his love for uh, Cleopatra. And that Cleopatra did well to uh, sacrifice her kingdom also uh, as he sacrificed uh, his empire for her sake. Also she uh, sacrificed her kingdom and her life for the sake of her love for Antony. Okay, so both of them, they sacrificed uh, uh, either the empire or the kingdom for, um, Antony, for each other. Okay, All for Love is a historical play. You need to know this, that it's a historical play, it's not a romantic play, it's not a uh, social play or whatever, but it is a historical play which is, uh, which means that it belongs to these historical events that happened long time ago. So, uh, All for Love is a historical play Dryden dependent on Shakespeare's play Antony and Cleopatra. So, uh, uh, as you can see here in front of you that All for Love that was written by Dryden is a historical play and when Dryden wrote this play he depended as you can see he depended mainly on Shakespeare's play Antony and Cleopatra so you know that uh, Shakespeare uh, wrote uh, a very famous play uh, which is uh, uh, Antony and Cleopatra and uh, uh, Dryden when wrote his play also uh, All for Love, he depended mainly on uh, these, uh, uh, on this uh, work of Shakespeare, Antony and Cleopatra. And as you can see that he uh, also uh, chose the same uh, names of his, uh, uh, of his uh, characters, of his main characters in the play also Antony and Cleopatra. Okay, now we come to uh, a very important point. So, uh, in, in the previous uh, pages, we concentrated on uh, the dramatic works of John Dryden, the comedies, the tragedies, the uh, tragic comedies, and the operas, and this uh, part that we uh, have just uh, explained and mentioned. 
is very important because uh, you will have a question about this uh, part which is selecting one of these works and saying one of these is a tragedy or a comedy or whatever. Then we move to another point which uh, is the title and the subtitle of the play and how Dryden got his fame uh, uh, from writing poetry and writing criticism more uh, even uh, than uh, the uh, writing drama. Now we move to uh, another important point, another uh, important point which is about a summary of uh, the play, starting of course with a summary of Act 1. You need to know the events of the play because uh, all the questions will depend mainly on these events. So you need to know what happened uh, throughout the play, the, the events, how the play uh, started, what happened in Act 1, what happened in Act 2, till you reach the end which is in Act uh, 5. Okay. So the events here, the story itself is very important and most of the questions of course about this part will be from uh, these summaries that you will have about Act 1, Act 2, or whatever. Okay, a summary of Act 1, we have uh, portents and uh, prejudice witnessed by Serapion. Uh, this is the subtitle. We have here the play opens with. The play opens with. It opens with what? Opens with a speech by whom? By Serapion. And who is uh, Serapion? He is a priest uh, of the temple of Isis in Alexandria. So the play started with the speech of that priest who is uh, the priest of the temple of Isis in uh, Alexandria. Okay. What was in uh, that speech by uh, Serapion? Serapion in his opening speech uh, uh, gives an account of what? Of central, of certain portents and prejudices which have been occurring frequently in Egypt. Portents and prejudices, these are strange uh, things that uh, might be uh, supernatural things that, uh, that might happen. So, uh, in his opening speech, he gives an account, he mentioned uh, some uh, certain portents and the prejudices which have been occurring frequently in Egypt. He had seen a wire wind blowing furiously and the doors of the underground tombs of the Egyptian kings opening suddenly. So uh, he saw that these, the, the doors of the uh, Egyptian kings, of the tombs of the Egyptian kings, opened suddenly. He had then witnessed the ghosts of the uh, period Egyptians, of the buried Egyptians, kings coming out of their tombs and standing on their graves. Okay, of course, these are. All of these are uh, superstitions and of course they are not real. The ghosts were groaning. So he, he uh, the, the priest here is telling that he saw all these uh, things. So the ghosts were groaning and a voice full of grief had then said that Egypt was on the verge of destruction and extinction. So he said that he heard a voice full of grief uh, had then said that Egypt was on uh, the verge of destruction and extinction. Okay. Now, uh, Next page, as you can see, uh, we have here a conversation between Serapion and Alexis. So after saying this speech to the audience, 
He uh, had uh, a, a conversation with Alexis. So let's see what happened in that conversation between Serapion and Alexis. Alexis has overheard. Uh, Serapion's account of the supernatural happening. So he heard him when he was speaking loudly about all these supernatural uh, happenings. So uh, he uh, started to uh, speak and to talk with him. But Alexis does not believe that uh, Serapion has actually witnessed these occurrences. So uh, he did not believe in all uh, these uh, supernatural uh, happenings or supernatural things that happened and which Serapions uh, ha ha had mentioned, uh, which is about the groaning of the ghosts, the opening of the tombs and all these uh, things. So Alexis did not believe in this. Alexis calls Serapions or calls uh, not only he did not believe him, but he scolds him. Scolds means uh, to to insult Serapion for having described the happenings which he claims to have actually uh, witnessed, but which, according to uh, Alexis, are a product of uh, Serapion's overheated imaginations. So uh, Alexis believed that all what uh, Serapions uh, mentioned or what he mentioned uh, uh, only uh, it's just uh, something out of his imagination, something that he imagined, something that he uh, believed in, only in his imagination, but for Alexis all these uh, things were not uh, real, okay? So according to Alexis, are a product of Serapion's overheated imagination. Uh, Serapion and Alexis then talk about the prevailing situation in Alexandria. Alexandria is uh, under a siege by uh, the Roman troops of Octavius, Caesar. So Alexandria at that time uh, was under the siege by the Romans uh, of activist uh, Caesars. Serapion uh, says that if Antony is defeated in his war against Octavius or, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, or if Antony gets reconciled with Caesar, uh, Egypt would become merely a province of the Roman Empire, which means that if they accepted this reconciliation with uh, Octavius, it means that Egypt will uh, belong to uh, Octavius himself and would then be exploited by the Romans, which means the Roman will occupy Egypt if it happened a reconciliation between Antony and Octavius. Okay? Just as, just at this moment, a stranger is seen arriving in Alexandria. Who is that uh, stranger? Uh, uh, as you can see, Alexis recognizes this stranger as Ventidius. Also, Ventidius is one of the main characters in this play. So, this stranger that uh, was seen by uh, Alexis uh, that arrived recently in Alexandria is Ventidius. And who is uh, Ventidius? He is an army general owing allegiance to Antony, which means that he was uh, an army uh, general and he uh, was quite loyal and faithful to Antony. Ventidius Strong believes that Cleopatra had been responsible for the reunion of uh, Antony. You will find during out the play, you will find that Ventidius hates Cleopatra. Why he hates her? Because he loves Antonio as a friend and as a brother. And he believes that Cleopatra 
uh, is the main reason for his ruin and for his failure, for his destructions. So you'll find him uh, throughout the play trying all the time to separate the two, to uh, make uh, Antony uh, leaves uh, Cleopatra and uh, just to take him to uh, ask him to move to another uh, play. Why? Because he loves Antonio as a brother and as a friend and he uh, is quite sure, he believes that Cleopatra is the main reason uh, for the destruction and the uh, ruin of uh, Antony himself. So Vantidius says that Cleopatra has bought golden chains around Antony and has made him a slave to her love, thus robbing him of his manliness. So he believes that uh, Antony now his manliness, his being uh, as being a man now was taken by him because of uh, his love to Cleopatra. Ventidius uh, deplores Cleopatra's demoralizing influence on Antony, who seems to have lost all his heroism and valor. Alexis, in reply, says that one of Antony's excellent qualities is his loyalty to the woman who loves him. Okay, now Ventidius' object in coming to uh, Alexandria. Object means aim. So why uh, uh, Ventidius came to uh, Alexandria? Uh, why? Because of this. The, 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 the reason that we mentioned uh, just uh, uh, right now, Ventidius has come to Alexandria. Why? In order to make an effort to win Antony away to separate him. Hmm? Antony away from this place and to prevail upon him to lead a fresh campaign against Octavius uh, Caesar. And uh, a gentleman attending upon Antony informs Avantidius that Antony has been leading a life of isolation. Uh, for the last many years, although Antony has given strict orders that he should not be disturbed in his solitude, he uh, Antony gave some orders to his uh, guards not to be disturbed by anyone. But uh, Ventidius is different. When he uh, Antony knew that he came, Ventidius decides to disobey the order and to have a talk with Antony. So he uh, said that I need to uh, meet him. The shadow of an emperor. Before actually intruding upon Antony's privacy, Ventidius overhears Antony talking to uh, himself. In his uh, soliloquy, Antony says that he would celebrate his birthday with double display of sadness, which means that he uh, was sad. And why he was sad? He had he said that he had enjoyed much glory during the years of his youth, but now there is no glory left for him to enjoy. He has now forsaken everybody, and everybody has forsaken him. That. Now he uh, uh, left everyone and he does not want to be with the others and the same, the others do not want to uh, be with him. He feels as if he is living alone in the midst of wild, of, uh, wild uh, nature, okay? So one of these is not there, I'm sorry, uh, only of wild nature. Okay, Antony's regret and remorse. Ventidius feels very depressed only on hearing Antony speaking to himself in tones of such despondency. He now approaches Antony and confronts him. Antony, instead, 
Antony instead of feeling pleased to see his general and friend so instead of being uh, happy to see Ventidius his, his friend says that wishes to be left alone that he wishes he wants to be alone Antony tells Ventidius that he cannot forget his defeat at the battle of Actium that he cannot forget his defeat he cannot forget his uh, defeat at the battle of Actium but Ventidius assures him that he can still defeat Octavius Ventidius offered of the support of 12 legions of Antony Ventidius uh, says that Antony should not live in an unreal world should not waste his time in idleness so he's trying to encourage him uh, uh, and to uh, uh, make him not so depressed as he saw him so uh, he then informs Antony that he had brought 12 legions uh, from Parithia to the banks of the river Nile so he brought with him uh, soldiers just to encourage him to uh, start war or to launch war against Octavius so uh, and those legions are waiting for Antony to take command of them Ventidius says that those legions are ready to fight against Octavius's forces on Antony's behalf though they would not fight for Cleopatra's uh, sake then we have here uh, a quarrel between friends and a reconciliation Antony feels somewhat annoyed he uh, was annoyed to find Ventidius making contemptuous reference to Cleopatra. Once he started speaking about uh, Cleopatra and, and telling him that uh, she was the main reason for his reunion and his destruction, Antony did not accept this and he therefore warns Ventidius not to speak a single word against her. Antony says that Ventidius is speaking not frankly but like a jealous uh, traitor. He accused his friend by being a, a jealous traitor. So Ventidius feels deeply hurt at being called a traitor and says that if he had been a traitor he would have gone and joined forces with Octavius which means that if he did not love Antony and if he was not sincere and loyal to him definitely he would leave and join the forces with Octavius Antony uh, realizing his mistake he uh, got back his mind and uh, knew that he was mistake in accusing um, uh, Ventidius as being a uh, traitor so Antony realizing his mistake apologizes to uh, Ventidius whereupon Ventidius says that he uh, it would be better for Antony to kill him to regard him as a traitor Antony then appreciates uh, Ventidius sincerity he uh, was sure that Ventidius is sincere to him and says that while all the others have merely been flattering him Ventidius alone has spoken frankly and has spoken from a true feeling of friendship for him Antony then calls upon Ventidius to show him the way to victory because there is still time for them to set things right however Antony says 
uh, that the same time that Ventilia should not curse uh, Cleopatra. But although of this, he assured that he should not mention a word against uh, Cleopatra. Antony's uh, promise to leave Cleopatra and go with uh, Ventidius at the end of their talk with each other, um, Ventidius could convince and persuade Antony to leave uh, Cleopatra in order to uh, be saved. So Antony now promises to leave Cleopatra in order to go with Ventidius even though he loves her beyond life, beyond conquests, and beyond empire, though not being his owner. Antony says that Ventidius will once again see him fully armed to uh, fight and ready to uh, command the veterans waiting for him. He then assures Ventidius that his heart have given have again become a firm and a strong as they originally were. Once again Antony feels the desire to face his enemies in the battle. Now he decided to uh, launch uh, and to start a war against his enemy Octavius. He and Ventidius would lead their soldiers like time and death and would make their enemies taste the doom which is to uh, uh, overtake them. Now uh, let's have a look. We have already finished uh, Act 1, summary of Act 1. You need now to see uh, samples of the questions and again as I'm doing in every lecture, these are not the questions that we are going to have in the final, but these are just as you can see samples of the questions to make you uh, familiarized with the types of questions that we have. For example, like this one, All for Love, which, which is the title of our play, is a, and as you can see, is a romantic play is a social play, is a historical play, or is a tragic play? Of course, uh, as you can see, uh, as it is written, the correct answer is C, which is All for Love is a historical play. Okay, let's move to another question, which is a stranger is seen arriving in Alexandria. Alexis recognizes this stranger as who uh, uh, appeared at the very beginning uh, of the act in Alexandria as a stranger. Of course, we have four choices. We have Ventidius, we have Cleopatra, we have Antony, and we have Octavia. Of course, the correct answer here is A. Of course, as we said that Ventidius is the one, he is the stranger that arrived in Alexandria and uh, who uh, uh, Alexis recognizes him as a stranger. Okay, now I have already finished uh, Act 1, a summary of Act 1. Hope you uh, uh, have an idea, a good idea now about this act and how your questions will be in the final exam. Best of you to all, uh, all of you, uh, please study hard. Uh, I'll do my best to help all of you. Thank you very much, and inshallah, uh, I'll see you uh, in the next lecture with also a summary of Act 2. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.